So, good morning, saints. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a hard message today. I'm going to need your indulgence. I'm going to need some time. I need, I need your patience. Give me a little time. And if at the end I made you mad, feel free, line up. <laughs> I'm serious. And come and slap me on one side of my face. I guarantee you, I'm going to give you the other side. I'm a follower of Jesus. It's a hard message. I'm a great fan of Joel Osteen. So I like that kind of a positive flow. But every once in a while, the Lord will do something differently. And the Lord gave me this message for a while now. And last week I sat there, last week Sunday, before, even before the preacher came. And I remembered how we rejoiced the Friday night before it was a good service. And the Sunday before it was a good service and we were rejoicing very much. And I'm saying to myself, well, this message is not calling, but it's a moment of rejoicing. And I'm sitting there and I'm wondering what's going on. And then Pastor Kimbrough, he came on, and he did what he had to do. And at some point, I think at the end, it had to be the Spirit of God. He read a scripture. He said, if my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the evil ways, I will hear from heaven. And I will heal the land. In the midst of rejoicing, he brought that word. It had to have been from the Holy Spirit, Pastor Kimbrough. Thank you. Amen. The Holy Spirit moves in this church. Amen. And some time ago, Sister Anne-Marie, she said to us, get back into the word. And then Pastor Kimbrough another time again said, babe, we need a bath into the word. So where I'm going this morning is a little difficult, but bear with me. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, and in Jesus, I come, and I bring your people, and I bring this message to you. Let heaven rule in Jesus' name. Father, together we take authority over the forces of darkness, and we bind the powers of evil, and we lift, Lord God, your word. And we ask for your help now. We ask for your deliverance, your blessings. We thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I was praying and I was wondering what's happening. So much sickness among us. Pains everywhere. I myself sometimes I get up in the morning and I can hardly walk. Where did that come from? Pain in the feet. And then COVID. As if somebody opened a door and COVID just came. COVID is just all over the place. And I was wondering about it. And I was praying about the COVID. Now, who here never had COVID? Well, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> and who had COVID only once? I'm better than you. I had it twice. What I'm doing here to let you know we are in it together. Amen. I ain't going to pull myself out and play some super holy man. Amen. But something is wrong. Amen. Some things went wrong. And we need to get back. It has to be. Besides COVID, I had prostate surgery. After God healed me. And they know he healed me. They took my biopsy. They took tests. They couldn't find anything. Amen. And it came back again. But there's a reason. In 2019, I fasted 21 days for this church. And at the end of the fast, God showed me a few things. I mentioned vaguely to the pastor. By the way, please don't blame pastor for this message. I didn't tell him what I was going to preach. And the Lord showed me some things after the fast. And I'm going to bring 
three of those things that God showed me today. One has to do with the communion, which I mentioned to him before, and it's very telling. It's a straight, straight bullet. Sickness and death among us. Now, I question it. Because when I look at Exodus 23, 25, I would like you to put up the, the, the scriptures as much as possible on the board if you can. Exodus 23, 25. God was still in Israel. He said, and you shall serve the Lord your God and he shall bless your bread and your water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of you. He's speaking to Israel. I always say, we are the beloved of God. We are accepted in the Son of God himself. Amen. Israel, wonderful as Israel is, is not better than we are. And this is his promise to Israel. And in Psalm 91.10, the Bible says, There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. Amen. Is the word of God true or false? Some things went wrong. A thousand, Psalm 91, 7, a thousand shall fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. That's the word of God. And the main reason God gave for Israel's fall or their sickness or their calamity is found in Deuteronomy 28, 15 to 68. I'm not going to read that. But it has to do with sin. Plain and simple sin. Now again, hear me carefully. And I want to make it plain to you. You are not sinners. We are not sinners. We are saints. But we do sin. We do disobey. All of us. So be very careful now. I don't like condemning. I don't believe in condemning. We're not condemning, condemning anyone. God loves his children. And sometimes he chastens, sometimes he allows things to build us. It's to build us, to help us, to make us better, not to destroy us. And you might ask the question, you know, why am I, why am I preaching Old Testament scripture in the day of grace? Well, hear what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7.1. He says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. And I like, I like how Paul puts it. Let us. He didn't say cleanse yourself. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The reason why he says perfecting holiness is because we are a holy people. The unsaved cannot perfect holiness. Again, don't put yourself down. Don't knock yourself. We are a holy people. But we are in Christ. But Paul is saying, let us cleanse ourselves of filthiness of flesh and spirit. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This is why we have to talk about disobedience and sin or wrong things. Now, Paul spoke to the Corinthian church and he had some hard things to say to the Corinthian people. But I love how he starts his, his talk or his message or his writing to them in 1 Corinthians. Um, in 1 Corinthians verse 2, after he introduced himself, he says, unto the church of God which is at Corinth. Unto the church of God which is in Okoye. Yeah. To them that are sanctified in Christ, we are called to be saints. With all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So he's putting us right there with the holy ones, right? And 1 Corinthians 1 uh, verse 4. He says, I thank my God always on your behalf. 
for the grace of God which is given unto you by Jesus Christ. And I will continue 1 Corinthians 1, 5. He says that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. And verse 6. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. You think that's a holy church? Yeah. That church has got it together. That's us too, huh? So that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul recognizes and accepts that they and us are children of God. And he says in, in, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, he said, don't you know that you are the temple of God Amen. and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Amen. DLA, do you know that? <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 3.21, therefore let no man glory in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Pastor Omar or Pastor Kimbrough or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. And you belong to Christ. You are Christ. And Christ is God's. Praise the Lord. So you are not sinners, saints. Yet, there is something wrong in the midst. Something is wrong. Because he, he goes on now in 1 Corinthians 3, 3. He says, you are yet carnal after all of that. For us, there is among you envying and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? No, I like that. Are you not carnal and walk as men? As men. So he's saying that we are more than normal men. We are more than normal people. He said you're walking as men. He doesn't say you are. Get the difference. We have the ability and the privilege to walk as holy ones or to walk as men. So in that they were doing, they were walking as men. But the part that really gets me here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, after he praised them so much, he says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, <laughs> and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. In the church. In the church. Holy people. When we hear these things, we prick ourselves and we, we think about them. And again, we do not condemn ourselves. But we understand what's happening. He said, your glorying is not good. So sometimes we could glory and we could show them. We could we do all the wonderful things. But we need to come down and settle things sometimes. Your glorying is not good, he says. Now, so the first problem that happens or is happening in the church, not only in DLA, but the church as a whole and in our lives, is the problem of fornication. Now, I said again, 21 days of fasting brought this on. I ate only at night. Now, before I read you what he says about that fornication, and he was speaking to... Um, okay, I think it's First Corinthians eleven one, but I, I I would like you to put up uh, First Corinthians fourteen thirty seven. First Corinthians fourteen thirty seven. That's right. Now hear me, the man who is speaking. He says here, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Amen. I am not preaching to you. I'm reading the word of God. I'm going to read more than preach. 
Before I even go further, Paul is saying, acknowledge that what he is writing is the word of the Lord. So the first problem in 1 Thessalonians, now he talked to the Corinthians, but the Thessalonians, all the churches have the same problem. That is not on the, that is not on the screen. He says, furthermore, then, that is 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 to, uh, 1 to 8. I'll read it. He says, furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we give you by the Lord Jesus, by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now we are sanctified in Christ, through Christ. You're not getting towards sanctification. Christ has become for us righteousness and sanctification. But he's saying that God wants us to be remain sanctified. That's what it is here. He says that you abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence. Concupiscence means desire or craving, longing. Even as the Gentiles which know not God. Again, he separated us from the world. Why would he be saying that to children born again? You see, through faith. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despises, despises the word, does not despise man, but God, who has also given unto you, unto us, his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the genes of God in us. And that is what makes us a different human being. That's what makes us different, the genes. Yes. That makes us saints and different. And Paul is saying, God wants sanctification. And saints of God, fornication is not only when two unmarried people are involved sexually. It is any sexual immorality that takes place. Sexual immorality is fornication. Adultery is fornication. Fornication is a, is a covering word. And you have all these breakdowns of fornication. Sexual immoralities. And I don't have to list to you what happens, what's happening these days. But now it has become accepted. Where it is okay for two people to live together unmarried. And sing in the choir and play the music and even preach. But, but, but besides that, among married folks, sometimes what we do are sexually immoral. We follow the world. I don't look at the movies. I can't stand the sort of things that come on the screen. But some people would look, Christians will look at these things and then want to perform and try out what the ungodly people are doing. Like acrobats and all kind of a thing. Confusing the will of God. And doing things that are not supposed to be done because we are married, it doesn't mean that we cannot commit fornication. Fornication is sexual immorality. And some of us have been involved in things, well, not me anymore. <laughs> in the beginning, it used to bother us. But you know, there's a scripture that we twist. The scripture that says, if your conscience condemns you, God is greater. That is twisted around and people think it means, well, if your conscience condemns you, don't bother because God is greater. That's not what it means because the following verse will explain what it means. It says, if your conscience condemns you, know that God is greater than your conscience. In other words, if your conscience, man, is condemning you, how much more is God? When you feel uneasy about a thing, your conscience is condemning you. That's right, that's right. Yeah. And if you were married, husband and wife, and there is a situation going on, you need to come together and pray about it. And as long as one person's conscience is bothering, you need to get away from that thing. Yeah. And some people have become hardened in their behavior. Yeah. 
So now their conscience does not bother them anymore. But we need to get back to where the conscience was bothering us because the thing that was a sin then is still a sin now. And sin brings sicknesses and destruction. God is saying, come off, come away from fornication. Come away from sexual immoralities in your mind, in your thoughts. Some people are not doing it, but they're reading it and they're thinking about it. They're looking at it. They're feeding their spirits by God. Fornication is a big thing in the church today. I don't want to, again, I don't like hitting or knocking people. Look, I love you all. Amen. I love my children. I got my first son is 40, what, seven? I still call him Poe. My second son, I call him Petney. My third son, my second son, Jambo. My third son, Jeff Sweets. He's in, th he's in his 30s. And when they sin, I come down on them. But I love them. I don't cast them aside. Don't let nobody cast you aside. You are not sinners. You are saints. Uh, just get right. Just, just, just let, us, let, let us come up. Let us come up a little bit higher. Yeah. And if you're doing something, if you're struggling with an issue, bring it before God. God can take it away from you. Just to give you a little joke. I was struggling with coffee. No, it's coffee. <laughs> Caffeine. Coffee. And was it last Sunday, I think, when, 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 when Brother Mike preached? Anyhow, Sunday before. I said, that's it. I give up coffee. Right? And I was feeling good. I was going to, thank you, Lord, I give up coffee. But after a while, I said, Lord, you got to forgive me with this one. <laughs> I got to have it. And when I went back drinking coffee, I felt real good. I felt relaxed. You know, I felt good. Some things, you know, we bother about, they're not necessarily sinful. They might be hurting us. We could, you know, the Bible said with moderation. So I'm back to drinking, and I feel okay. But what I'm trying to say is this, that God can help you. Whatever it is that you're struggling with. You see, the inclination doesn't mean that you have to go through with what you're thinking about. You know, I would like to tell people who are gay, and trust me, I love them from the bottom of my heart. I love gay people. I love homosexuals. I love sinners. I do. And I'm concerned about them. I look at them sometimes. This young man, he was crying after they shot up a few of them in a club. Crying. Big man. He said, that's the only place I can feel at home. Nobody wants us. They go in and they kill them. I don't believe in that. It's wickedness. And we must pray for them. And we must love them. And we must show them deliverance through Christ Jesus. That's what we must do. You know, but sometimes I would like to let them understand and know that some of us who are heterosexuals, who are so-called straight, we have as much temptations as they have to do the wrong things. You walk in on a job, some of you men will know, you walk in on a job with a pretty woman, a pretty, and she is just, you know, just, she's just very nice. Very nice to you and wonderful. And, and when you go home, you, your wife mouth stretch like this. And you're, and you're tempted. You're tempted. No, that is not happening to me at all. So. <laughs> I had to make that straight. <laughs> That's not me. I love my wife. My wife was 17 years old when I started dating her. And I love her now as I did back then. She gets me mad every once in a while. She really gets me mad, but I wouldn't want to live without my wife. And I look at her many times. She doesn't realize I'm looking at her and, and loving her. But the point I'm trying to make is this. The so-called straight people are just as tempted. But we would not fall into the temptation because we know it is sin. We know it is wrong. So the inclination doesn't mean that you have to go through with the temptation. So help gay people to understand that. I've seen, I had a friend when I was in secondary school. This man was a girl. I mean, he really looked like, even pretty like a girl. But you know what it is, is that in our culture, this thing was not accepted. So he grew up to be a boy looking like a girl. He, got, he came here, he got married, he had children. 
You know, he passed away some time ago. I really wanted to see him before he died to find out how he made it, you know. But a lot of men are like that. They're gay, but they, you know, they know it is wrong. So they do not fall into the pattern. And God will help you. God will help me. God will help us if we ask for his help and do what is right. So fornication, saints. I wanted to pause and ask us to sort of get into ourselves. It just was, this is one sermon with three messages. And pastor already warned me. Pastor, I love you guys, you know. Don't preach long, you know. Don't, you know, he always says that, you know. Anyhow, so I got to move on. But please, pay attention to what the Lord been speaking to you about. And come out from among them. And be separate. Let us clean up your mind, your body. The Bible says the body is a temple of the Lord. You cannot do what you want with your body. Married or unmarried. Let us clean up. Yes. Now the second problem that we need to solve. Bear this in mind again. If you, can you put up 1 Corinthians 14, 37 again? Because this one is a little bit, is difficult for me. This one. But when you look at the man who is saying it, Paul the Apostle. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual... Let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Amen. I'm going to read what Paul says. I'm not going to preach it. I'm going to read it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 to, is it 1 to 6? 1 Corinthians 11, 1 to 6. Ah, I would like it to be up there. He says, be followers of me, even as I also, I'm of Christ. Excuse me. He said, now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. Now remember, I told you I fasted and prayed for 21 days. He says, but I would have you know, and I'm not boasting about it. I'm just telling you so that you know I'm not speaking idly. He said, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. True. And the head of the woman is the man. False. Is it? And the head of Christ is God. He says, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. Verse 5. But every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. I'm reading. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Again, the word of the Lord, not my word. Do I know I've heard it said? It is a matter of respecting the presence of God. When you dishonor the head, you dishonor God. Respecting the presence of God. That's what it is. And I've heard it said that for a woman, your hair is your covering. You heard that, right? Okay. If your hair is your if the hair, if the hair is the covering. If the hair is the covering, hear me. Verse 4 says. Not verse 4. Yeah. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. So if the hair is a covering, then the only people that honor God here is people like Brother Z and Brother... All the bald-headed people. <laughs> That's the only people that honor God. Because he said if you pray, if a man... Your prayer is with his head covered. The point I'm trying to make is this your hair is not the covering that God is asking for. He's asking for a covering of the head. Again, I'm not saying thou shalt. Or you, or you could come in next Sunday just as you are. It's okay. The fact is, I've bring the I've brought the word to you. I've brought to you what the Lord has placed on my heart and on my mind. From my wife, go right up and down. I can't make her put on a covering. If she wants it, she doesn't want it. That's good. That's fine. Again, I say you are not sinners. You are saints, children of God. That's the word. 
And the third matter that the Lord spoke to me about, which I had mentioned briefly to Pastor, but we didn't talk much about it, is the Lord's table or the breaking of bread. And there we have a straight word from God. In 1 Corinthians 11, 29 to 30, Paul is writing, the same Corinthian people that he was talking about. He said, he that eats and drinks unworthily, eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So to answer the question, why are there many sickly and weak among us? I search for answers in the Bible. Paul is giving it straight. Eat and drink unworthily. No, it's, it's not about you. It's not about your being able to confess all the sins that you have sinned. It's not about you. It's about the Lord's body. It says, not discerning. That is the reason. To discern, make a fuss about the Lord's body is very important. To discern means to separate. Make a distinction. Discriminate. To prefer. In other words, it's not just a piece of thing just like that. It's not just take it and go and leave it. You have to recognize the Lord's body. This is the word of God. You see? He says that's the reason why in an unworthy fashion we handle the bread. We handle what we think. As a matter of fact, I'm coming to the bread just now. What was happening there? Like Pastor Kimber we read this morning in Luke 22, 19. Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. And he break it Give unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. He says, This is my body. We don't have to try to explain it. Just take what Jesus says. Some people say it represents, it, you know, the Catholics say it becomes flesh and blood. I don't, I'm not business with all of that. Jesus said, This is my body. What do you mean it is his body? Does it become little pieces of Jesus's? Well, let me ask you something. Aren't we the body of Christ? Amen. Does it mean that we are, we are individual Jesuses? We are the body of Christ. Amen. We don't try to dissect and define it. We just take it we are the body of Christ. And as the body of Christ, we present ourselves in holiness and in righteousness. This is my body. Jesus made a fuss over this thing. A fuss, a big fuss. How do we present the body of Christ? God is particular about what we bring to him. Here is what Malachi says about the people's gift. The people bringing their gift to God. Malachi 1.6 says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts. Unto you, O priests, that despise my name. And you say, wherein have we despised your name? 180 says, and if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto your governor. Give your governor that now. What your name, DeSantis? Give him that. Will he be pleased with you? Or accept the person? Accept your person? says the Lord of hosts. And Malachi 1.14 But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and vows and sacrifice unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts. And my name is dreadful among the heathen. Will you? Um, if you will not hear and if you will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name says the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already because you do not lay it to heart. Why am I reading this? 
Because I wonder, is God satisfied with what we are doing? Now, we could take our sickness, our pain, our COVID. We could clap and shout and go back home with them and come back next day and do the same. Or we could seek the Lord to find out what's wrong. The Bible says that's the reason why many are weak and sickly among you. Is he satisfied? No, I, I, I held back my communion. I held it back. Because I believe that we should honor God. I believe so. And if we take communion once a month, and it is too much to get a decent bread and break it with the ministers praying over it and serve it. We say it's COVID and you don't want people to touch it. Well, you could use a tongue and you could give, the people come up with their hands and you could give it out. If we cannot honor God like this once a month, but we could pick this, whatever this is up, whoever is making it, maybe come from China, I don't know. I'm serious. God gave his son, his only begotten son, the body of Christ. The almighty God became flesh for us. Why can't we make a bread for him? My God, why? 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 We made it easy. But you know what it is? If you see me not taking mine next time, it's not because I have sin in my life. It's because I fear God and I honor God. And I don't believe in this. Hallelujah. Jesus continued in Luke 22, 19. He said, Luke 22, 19, um, you had it just now there, yeah. He took bread and he gave thanks and break it. Yeah, we did that part. He said, this is my body um, given for you. And remember, oh yes, he says, do this in remembrance of me. Now, this is another problem I think we're having. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Now, with due respect, and I know we follow tradition. I know the cross is very important. I know that. But let's for a while look at the word of God. He didn't say do this in remembrance of the cross. Hear me. Like the pastor read this morning. Before he suffered, he said, I want to do this thing with you. Before I suffered. Before, not on the cross or after. And Pastor read, um, pre preached a thing, he did it last month. That Jesus didn't give his broken body. And by the way, that word broken in Corinthians, if you look at the Greek for that word broken, the only time they use that word, that word for broken is to break bread. That's the only place besides breaking bread it is used in that Corinthian scripture, uh, broken when Paul said broken for you. That word means breaking bread, the, the bread he was talking about. That is not the body of Christ which was never broken. So anyhow, Jesus is saying here, do this in remembrance of me. Now, how do we remember Someone. Remember, brother so-and-so, remember, so, uh, if, 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 if I pass away, how are you going to remember me? Let's say I go, no, it's not, not going to happen. But let's say something dreadful happened with me. Every time you come to talk about me, you go talk about how I died and how I suffered? No. How did we remember Martin Luther King? We played his speeches. We remembered him. We remember what he did. We remember Jesus. Yes, he, was, he, he suffered for nine hours. But he lived for over three and a half years working miracles. Remember him. Jesus always reversed natural disorders. He turned blindness into sight. Lameness, he made people walk. He stopped a woman who was bleeding for how many years? He calmed a great storm of wind. He made a great storm. He came to bring light in darkness. Remember me, he says. He was the let there be in the beginning when God said let there be light. It's the word of God. He was that word. Remember me. Not the cross. Remember who I was. Who I am. So you can live like me. They said in Mark 656. Into every village or city that Jesus went. They laid the sick in the streets. 
and they begged him that he might touch them. Remember that. When we remember that, we become jealous. Not a bad jealousy. Or ze uh, jealous, yeah. We wonder why it's not happening now. I heard a Muslim guy spoke about Christians. He said Jesus was powerful. Where is your power? Come on. Remember him. When we remember him, we have to question. I know some things have happened, little miracles here and there. I can tell you a few. My wife and I were in the deep. There was nobody around. And she was pulling me down to drown me. Yes, she was. And I couldn't swim with a loaf of bread in my hand. How much? I couldn't take her out of the deep. Huh? But Jesus was there with us. And Jesus told me what to do. And I did it. And she's here and I'm here now. So he is with us. I'm not saying that nothing is happening. I could tell you more. Remember me. We have to remember Jesus some more. We come to church and we hear a sermon and we sing some song and we go back home and we forget Jesus. Who was Jesus? Who was Martin Luther King? You know, all that he did. Huh? But Jesus, all we remember is the cross. Hmm? He taught us, love your enemies. Huh? Do good to those that hate you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. He taught us how to live. He taught us to forgive. Remember him. And if you forget his words, go back and read it again. And remember him. He introduced us to the kingdom of God. When they asked, who did sin? This man or his parents or whoever, a blind man. Jesus said, nobody sinned. But that the works of God might be made manifest in him. Some people believe that God made the man blind so he could heal him. No, no, no. That's not what you're saying. You see, sin reigned unchecked until Jesus came. When he came, he brought in the kingdom. He brought in power. He is saying, I'm going to show you what the kingdom of God is like. I'm going to show you the works that my father does. And then he went away. Before he went, he said, the same works that I do, you shall do. And greater works. But we forget that. And we lift up the cross. I don't wear no cross on me. A black man have enough cross. I just walk in the street. I don't wear no cross on me. I'm not saying you shouldn't or you should. But how much of Jesus are you remembering? He went on the cross to die for us. Like all of them mentioned by the Sammy. Mr. Sammy used to be here. He says, he gave, he gave his children a, a, a credit card. And then he went to pay for it. That's the cross. He paid for it. He didn't stay there very long. God the Father raised him from the dead and lifted him, the Bible says, far above. Far above all principalities and powers and seated him at his right hand. Remember that and live that. I believe in God for full restoration of my health after prostate surgery. And when the devil comes at me, I remember Jesus. Yeah, and I tell the devil in his face. No, there are some devils, they don't want to go, you know. <laughs> like I've heard preachers cause COVID. I think Kenneth Copeland was one. COVID, we puke you. COVID like a bajon, you know. <laughs> a friend of mine lived in Queens. So he said a friend of his lived in Queens. And a big fellow climbed up the fire. fire the, what the fire? Escape, right? Fire escape. And coming into the man's window. <laughs> so when he see when the guy who lives in the apartment saw the big guy coming through the window he went for a knife he pulled a knife and, he, and he's going to the guy he said the guy looked at him and he's coming still he said the guy looked at him and he's coming still even though he had his knife in his hand Satan could behave like that sometimes when you call the name of Jesus he's coming still he want to see if you're going to give up. He want to see if you're going to fail. But if you stand your ground and say in the name of Jesus Christ, you got to go. Wait a little bit. Wait a little bit. God is coming. Wait a while. He is coming, saints. If you call on him, he will come. He will come if you call on him. 
as bad as Satan thinks he is. Look at us. We hardly lost any members in COVID. We didn't lose any as far as I know. But it hit everybody. All of us. God sustained us. Call on God. Remember Jesus. The communion is about Jesus. The communion is about joy and gladness. It's not to moan about the cross. Yes, the cross, but for God's sake, Satan used the cross to kill Jesus. He is using the cross to keep us battered and empty and dull and naked and scared. He is still using the cross against us. Making us believe that we have to go back on the cross in order to live. There's a man that I used, to, I used to take care of. Blind guy. And every time I go, we go to pray, he will start, Lord Jesus, I come to you at the foot of the cross. Every time. And I will tell him, no, I'm not going there with you. No, I never said it so, but I, I meant it. I come to you at the foot of the cross. Where he, Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace and find mercy and help. You tell me you come at the foot of the cross. And he was one of the most miserable Christians I ever met. He was blind. I'm not talking about Brother Z, yeah? <laughs> Brother Z is a good man. I'm talking about another guy that I used to take care of. <laughs> another guy. So, the communion is about joy and gladness. Um, let me not miss. He says, um, yeah, right. And so, we're talking about the cross, just a little bit. And some people say the cross reminds you, right? But you know who's supposed to remind us? In John 14, 26. Oh, no. Um, I, 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 I jumped ahead. I jumped ahead. Okay, I, I'm going to skip to save time. Um, in thinking about Jesus, um, when Jesus says, um, or when Paul says, um, every time you do this, you, uh, you, you show his death. You proclaim, yeah? His death, his death. You proclaim, and that proclamation is for you, eh? not to the world. In other words, you, 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 you're recognizing his death. But you see, the thing about his death, just briefly, uh, you don't need to put it up. The thing about his death, what about his death? It's not to make you sad. To his death, we were reconciled to God, number one. Okay? To his death, he presents us boldly and unblameable in the sight of God. And to his death... The beneficiaries can now collect on the will. Hebrews 9, 16 to 17 says, For where a, a, a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength while they are alive. If somebody leaves something in, in, in their will for you, you can't get a ying until the person dies. His death is for us to receive what was promised in the new covenant. That's why he died, saints. For us to receive, not for us to moan and groan after him and pretend you're dying too. He died, he suffered, that we might live. And so the communion is about joy and gladness. So the Bible says in, 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 in about remembering, okay, about the cross, you want to remember him by looking at the cross. In John 14, 26, Jesus said, But the Comforter, hmm, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. It is the Holy Ghost, not the cross. It's the Holy Spirit, not the cross. Do you have him today? Are you conscious of him today? Do you honor him today? Bring up the Holy Ghost. I don't need to look at the cross. The Holy Spirit reminds me. Even of things that I forget. So the communion is about joy and gladness. When he was going. Before he died. He said you now have sorrow. That is, you, he said you now have sorrow. But I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice. No this is for all times. Even for now. After the resurrection. And your joy no man shall take. No man takes it, not even now, from you. Thank you Lord. He says, hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Amen. He wants our joy to be full. The communion is a joyous thing. It's about joy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And the Bible says in Acts 2, 46-47, 
They continued daily with one accord in the, in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They, eat, they ate their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. There was joy. The communion is joy. And Acts 27 says, And upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. On the first day. Every first day of the week. Not to hear preaching. Not to hear singing. Yes, that is good. They came together to break bread. Why? Because in the breaking of bread, they remember the Lord, the Son of God. They remember the one who died for us. They remember the one who was raised from the dead. They remember Jesus. They remember all that he did. And they aspire to be like him. And in the days of the disciples in the early church, you read Paul. All the suffering that Paul suffered. He talked about the miracles he walked. You remember that? The great things that happened in the church. So saints of God, we need to wake up. Some things have gone wrong. We need to get back in the word and find out what it is. I am not satisfied and I'm not pulling myself away. We all are in the same boat. We must return to the word. There's a paved road. We must walk in that road. We have, we, we, we have cut tracks. We have cut tracks by our tradition. Our beliefs, things that the Bible didn't even say. We're saying and we're following these things. Hmm? God is able. The kingdom of God, and I'm done, is not in word, but in power. We ought not to stop until we see the power. Don't stop until you see the power. Cleanse yourself from fornication. Cleanse yourself from disobedience to the word of God. When the word of God says yea, you say yea. When it says nay, you say nay. We have to respect the body of Christ. I will leave that up to Pastor Ma and the deacons about what you're going to do about this. But I'm not going to take it. Christ is too precious. Think about the Son of God, the only Son, the only body. Come, Pastor Kimbrough, I'm done.